The first speaker in this session is Faye Doker from Imperial College London. Uh, and I see there is a fluctuation in the title, Causal Horizon Entropy in the Causal Set Approach to Quantum Gravity. Thank you, Yoma. And thank you to Eduardo and the other organizers for getting us all together online. Um, I also look forward to seeing you all in person sometime soon. Um, so Yoma's right, I've changed my title slightly and you'll see why I've done that um, as I go on. Um, so, oops, here's my plan of the talk. I'm going to give one slide on black hole entropy. That's pretty familiar to um, most people. I just want to emphasize one or two things. Um, and then I'll give very brief motivation underlying the approach to the problem of quantum gravity that I work on called the causal set approach or causal set theory. Um, and I'll also introduce, say something about causal horizons. I'll define a causal horizon and say why I think that we should be thinking about causal horizons rather than merely black hole um, event horizons. I will probably say very little about the discrete continuum correspondence in causal set theory. Um, I have a slide on that, but I'm going to gloss over that um, and it, it, but I'll say one or two things, but just in the context of the um, calculation that I'm going to tell you about for um, calculating the entropy, something like the entropy of a um, causal horizon and causal set theory. Um, uh, the calculation I'm going to show you is part of a strategy for working towards an understanding of the statistical mechanics of the thermodynamics of causal horizons in causal set theory. Um, I'll tell you how that strategy is going, and then I'll um, raise some discussion points at the end. And I'm going to take Boltzmann's constant to be one throughout the whole talk. So the black hole entropy, the value of it speaks of discreteness. It's an amazing thing. We, we don't have an agreed upon theory of quantum gravity, but the black hole entropy has a quantum gravitational value. And its value sets that it involves both G and H bar, and its value sets a scale, the Planck scale. And it also suggests that space time is discrete. So here's a cartoon of the black hole event horizon divided up into plaquettes of Planckian size. So the entropy is the number up to a factor of order one. It's the number of Planck area plaquettes that tile the event horizon of the black hole. So in fact, so if you, if you choose a particular uh, unit where eight pi g is equal to one, then the entropy looks in, it has a slightly less familiar form, which is s is equal to two pi times n, where n is the number of plaquettes of Planckian, uh, of Planck, air, Planck area. Um, and if you do a Boltzmann state counting of this kind of most simple-minded kind, where you just say, you declare there's this binary state zero or one on each plaquette, and you just calculate the number of states and take its logarithm, then you get n, the number of plaquettes times log two. So this is very suggestive, I think, even though it's very obviously very simple-minded, no one thinks the black hole event horizon is really divided, really tiled by little plaquettes like this, but it is, suggestive and it speaks to discreteness. And more concretely, the black hole entropy should, it's hard, I don't see why it wouldn't include the entanglement entropy of quantum fields in the background of the black hole as first um, uh, stated by Raphael Sorkin. 
And well, without a physical short distance cutoff, that entanglement entropy is infinite. Formally, it's, it, 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 it's infinite. If you put a cutoff in, then the entanglement entropy has the right form. It's proportional to the area. And it has the right order of magnitude if that cutoff is the Planck scale. The most economical way to implement such a cutoff, a short distance cutoff, is to hypothesize that space time is fundamentally discrete. Okay, so that's kind of one page uh, justification for why one should consider fundamental space time discreteness. Um, which is one of the pillars of causal set theory. And the other pillar is causal order. And causal order is central to GR and it's central also to black hole thermodynamics. So Roger Penrose won the Nobel Prize, hooray, for his work on what you might call global causal analysis and in particular uh, the singularity theorems. And every GR textbook is full of conformal diagrams or Carter Penrose diagrams with little light cones everywhere showing you as illustrations of the causal order um, of the space time. And black holes, which are the epitome of GR and classical black hole physics, such as the uniqueness theorems, the no hair theorems, the second law of black hole mechanics, they're tied to the causal nature of the black hole event horizon. It's defined in causal terms. Now, black hole horizons are special cases of causal horizons. So the understanding of black hole thermodynamics, not only the, the classical physics of black holes is tied to the to uh, causal structure, but the understanding of black hole thermodynamics is also tied to the causal nature of the horizon. For example, the understanding that we now have unready, um, acceleration radiation and a vacuum entanglement across Rindler horizon. And there's a unifying concept of causal horizons, which is first defined by um, Gibbons and Hawking, and then taken up by Jacobson and Parentani. And it, the definition is a causal horizon is the boundary of the closure of the causal past of a future infinite timelike curve. So causal horizons include black hole event horizons. So uh, black hole event horizons, uh, they're just special cases of causal horizons. But causal horizons also include Rindler horizons and cosmological horizons such as De Sitter horizons. And they're all conjectured but to have entropy and to obey the laws of thermodynamics, conjectured by, for example, specifically by Jacobson and Parentani. De Sitter horizons were first um, conjectured to have um, entropy and obey the laws of thermodynamics by Gibbons and Hawking. But now that's been widened and Ted Jacobson is known for, for his insistence that even local Rindler horizons should, should be thermodynamic. So the Jacobson's heuristic is that the thermodynamics of local Rindler horizons is more primitive even than GR. Okay, so the causal set approach to quantum gravity is founded on three pillars, two of which I've mentioned. Um, one is physical space-time discreteness. And for those of you of a more philosophical bent, you might think of that as a, repudi a full repudiation of physical infinity, of any kind of infinity in physics. The second pillar is that causal order is a more primitive organizing principle for physics, even than space and time. And that it is the space-time causal order of all the structures of continuum space-time that survives in the deep theory. And if you put those two things together, discreteness and order, you get a causal set. It's a transitive directed acyclic graph. And the elements of the set or the nodes of the graph are conceived of as, this, as atoms of space time. And the order relation on them is conceived of as being the, what underpins the space time causal order. And then the third pillar about which I'll say nothing in this talk is that the path integral furnishes a framework for quantum causal sets. 
and the path integral is a genuine alternative to the canonical psi framework in which quantum mechanics is a species of measure theory in which the Kolmogorov sum rule for probabilities fails and is replaced by a quantum sum rule. Okay. So a discrete causal order is a causal set. The space-time atoms you can think of as being smallest indivisible events. And it's been proposed independently several times. Um, and that's a good thing. The more times someone comes up with the same idea, the more confident you can be that there's something, um, something to it. So a causal set is a transitive direct day cyclic graph. Here's a very small example of one with five elements. But in the observable universe, if the discreteness is Planckian, is at the Planck scale, then the observable universe is made from 10, a huge number, 10 to the 240 um, elements. And the idea is that our space time in GR is just a continuum approximation, a fluid like continuum approximation to this fundamentally discrete entity. And the slogan here is order plus number equals geometry. So the order relations give rise to the causal order in the space time. The number of causal set elements uh, gives you by the counting measure, the, the um, volume measure of the continuum approximation. And together that's enough information to recover the full geometry, the full space time metric. Okay, so, I said that the finite value of the, of the black hole horizon entropy is one of the motivations behind causal sets. So they sh we should therefore be able to make progress in understanding horizon entropy from causal set theory. So how, do we gonna, how are we gonna make that progress? So here I think one sees the influence in, of the philosopher of physics, Mitsuo Takatani. So in Takatani's substantial phase of theory development, it's, it, one can take the lesson that there's nothing wrong with taking a long time to understand a structure kinematically before you have a real handle on its dynamics. This is a quotation from a paper by Raphael Sorkin, the main champion of causal set theory. And also, Takatani stressed that one should treat the phenomenology, all the phenomenology that you have as an important guide. So the, the area law in particular is not established physics in the sense of observational physics, regrettably, but nevertheless, in practice, the area law plays a phenomenological role in most quantum gravity approaches. One wants to recover it even though we, haven't, we don't have direct experimental evidence for it, we, we do want to recover it. And I don't know anyone who, doesn't, who disagrees with that, um, anyone working in quantum gravity who doubts that the value that we have of the causal set um, of the horizon, black hole horizon entropy is, um, is not physical. And so the area law, just following your nose, thinking, in the most direct way that you can, suggests that the entropy is a property of the horizon itself and not of any internal microstates. And this is particularly so if you take the black hole horizon to be just an example of a more general concept of causal horizon. So for example, a Rindler horizon. It's very difficult to, for a black hole, you could imagine that you have some idea of internal states, things inside the black hole. But for a causal horizon like a Rindler horizon, it's very difficult to see how you might attribute internal states to, um, that might be relevant to, to the entropy of a, of a Rindler horizon. Okay, so here's a strategy for how we might make progress in accounting for the horizon entropy causal horizon entropy from causal set theory. So kinematically, a black hole we think of in causal set theory, it is a causal set fundamentally. And it's a, a causal set that can be faithfully embedded in its own continuum approximation. 
So the idea is that if you have a black hole, it's really a causal set. And that causal set is something which could be embedded, the elements of the causal set could be embedded in that continuum approximation. And then a horizon is a partition of the causal set into in two, two portions, one inside and one outside the horizon. So here I've drawn a sort of cartoon. You're to think of this both as a space time and as a causal set, which are the, the dots. So the dots are embedded in the, in the space time and the, um, the order relations between the causal set elements are the same as the causal order, the space time causal order of those embedded positions in the continuum approximation. Okay, so here there's a horizon in the continuum approximation and the, the, and the causal set elements either fall inside the horizon or outside the horizon. So the, the horizon gives you a partition of the causal set into two pieces. The entropy, well, entropy increases, as we know, according to the second law. So there has to be some, so entropy means entropy at some time. So you need a hypersurface sigma on which the entropy is defined. And sigma, I'm going to consider to be some hypersurface, which again, divides the causal set into past and future. And so the, the, um, when we talk about area law, we mean the area of the intersection of some hypersurface sigma with the horizon H. So it's a co-dimension co two thing, the horizon the area of the horizon is co-dimension two. And you can see that these two hypersurfaces, H the, the horizon and sigma, the hypersurface that defines the time you're at, divides both the space time and the causal set into four. So it's a partition into four portions, inside and outside the horizon to the past and future of sigma. So, in the first instance, we, the strategy is to look for horizon molecules, that is small subcausal sets associated to the horizon. In other words, this intersection between H and Sigma, and we just count them. And the analogy is here to uh, just an ordinary gas at high temperature. At high temperature and the high temperature limit, the entropy of a gas is just proportional to, with some uh, temperature dependent factor of order one, proportional to the number of molecules of the gas. So that's, we're just gonna do that. Think, think of the horizon as being made of molecules and we're just gonna count them. And then we'd like to go beyond this and do a state counting of the sort of binary tile type. And you'll see what I mean by that, that sounds a bit vague, but we have a specific, um, example in mind and you'll see what I mean by binary tile paradigm. And we're guided by the requirement that we want a universally defined entropy that applies to any causal horizon, including black hole, cosmological and Rindler. So I haven't specified that H is a black hole horizon. It could be a Rindler horizon. In fact, it looks like one, of course, in the diagram I've drawn, um, or it could be a, a De Sitter horizon. And it's, this universality of all causal horizons that's prioritized in our causal set approach. And it has the potential to discriminate between different quantum gravity approaches. If one has to account for black hole entropy differently to De Sitter horizon entropy, then that seems odd, given that the, the, the horizons have the same universal character in terms of their causal, um, causal definitions. Okay, so here's the first attempt was made by um, Jamel Du and Raphael Sorkin. And what they did was they considered a faithfully embedded causal set in a space time which had a horizon and some hypersurface sigma. They proposed horizon molecules. And then due to the requirement 
that a causal set that's faithfully embeddable in a space time has to be a random sampling of the space time. And I, I can explain why that is um, in the question time, but just take it for granted for now. The number of these horizon molecules is a random variable. So there are many different causal sets that do the job of being possible um, underpinnings of this black hole, of this um, space time with a horizon in it. And the number of molecules then, if you just count it in any given, um, any given in, in causal set that's embedded is random, it's a random variable. And you can calculate the mean of that random variable. So success in this strategy would be that if you calculate the mean of the number of molecules, you get the area in discreteness unit. So L is the discreteness scale. You get the area in discreteness units up to some factor of order one. And that factor of order one may be dimension dependent, but it should be universal for all horizons, no matter what they are in that dimension or any kind of horizon, causal horizon, any kind of surface sigma um, up to fluctuations, because this is the mean, up to fluctuations and subleading corrections. Say you have five minutes. Thank you, Yuma. Okay, so here's a diagram of the, of the um, situation again. So what, uh, so here I've just said that L is the discreteness scale. It's set by the density of, the, of this process, this random process of sampling the elements of the space time. And what Raphael and Jamel did was that they considered, first of all, they considered a sigma that was null and they proposed that horizon molecules were links between causal set elements in the region I called minus minus, which is past of sigma outside H and plus plus, which is inside H and um, future of sigma. So they consider links. Links are irreducible relations, order relations in the causal set. And their proposal worked. It worked, it was universal when they checked it for Rindler and for dimensionally reduced Schwarzschild. 2D dimensionally reduced Schwarzschild, but it fails. It, this counting diverges in dimensions greater than two. Okay, but we took their strategy is we took their strategy seriously, and with some graduate students, I tried something different. So I tried. We tried to. We tried a, a surface sigma that was space like. And that was key to the success. Having space-like sigma allows you to localize elements of the causal set to the surface. So you consider, for example, this element X in the causal set. We require that the causal future of X to the past of sigma is empty. And the, in the Poisson process, that becomes more and more unlikely the further sigma is away, further x is away from sigma. So requiring that um, that the this read this cone above x to the past of sigma is empty means that x has to be tightly tight underneath sigma. And then we made the proposal that a molecule is a link again, a link like like um, Raphael and Jamel um, required, where p is both p both the elements of the causal set are to the past of sigma, one is inside and one is outside the horizon. P is maximal in the causal set to the past of sigma and Q is maximal but one. And you can prove analytically that the mean of the number of these molecules does have the correct form. In other words, it scales like the area in discreteness units and this constant of order one is universal for any causal horizon, any sigma, any space time, any curvature. For example, in two dimensions, it's a third, and in four dimensions, it's root three over 10. Okay. 
So I've just got two more slides. Discussion points. Are we counting entropy or are we just reading off a geometrical quantity, just this area of this intersection? There are other definitions of molecules that would also work probably with, and they would give us different um, coefficient CD, which one is right, which one is an entropy. So to do that, to go further, we need, firstly, we need a state counting rather than just this molecule counting. We need something which is more like a Boltzmannian state counting. And secondly, we need a proof in quantum causal set dynamics of the generalized second law. It's the sine qua non of entropy. If it doesn't increase, then it's not, it's not an entropy worth calling an entropy. Okay, so the second one, we have to wait until we have quantum causal set dynamics, which we don't have yet. But here's a proposal for state counting. If you consider the molecules that I defined before, they're links where these elements Q are to the pat are precedes the, the element P. And for each Q, there's only one P because each Q has to be maximal but one. So it can only have one P in its future. But for each P, there can be more than one Q, uh, as, a, as in the diagram that I've drawn. There's got P and it's got Q1 and Q2 to its linked to it to its past. So the links, these molecules, they form disconnected components. There's one disconnected component for each P. Hey, so excuse me, you are now pushing into your question. Tara. Okay, I'm I'm done. I'm gonna just I'm gonna just finish this slide. So here's a conjecture. If we let the P's be the analogues of the plaquettes, and we let the number of Q's linked to that be the state of that plaquette, and if there's a small number of different states that occur in fixed fractions, then you can calculate the number of states, you can take its logarithm, and you get this result here, which is n, the number of plaquettes, up to the order that n is the or n is the the um, area of the of the horizon in discreteness units up to some or, to some factor of order one, and we have numerical evidence of this working in the case of a Rindler horizon, and this is work in progress. We want to extend it to other horizons and see whether it is indeed universal. So that's it. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Faye. We have some time for questions. So please uh, raise your hand if you have a question. I know something that nobody asked. Well, uh, we do have a question here. Hi, this is my guardian. <laughs> Hi, Rob. Hi, Faye. Yeah, I, I'm just wondering a couple of things that I, I mean, it's probably my question reflects my uh, lack of understanding of how it's done. But I thought the idea of causal set theory is that causal structures emerge. So if you're assuming a space like surface, haven't you already assumed what the causal structure and a horizon maybe for that matter. But my, my point is, it looks like you've sort of assume the structure is already there, that the structure is supposed to e emerge for you. So I'm, I'm, it, it feels a bit like maybe there's circular reasoning. Now, probably there isn't, but this point is confusing. Sure, that, that's a very good question. So the, the causal order is fundamental. So it, it doesn't emerge. If you like the space, the continuum is an approximation and the, the, the continuum space-time causal order emerges, but the, the causal set, the fundamental entity has an order relation on it. So you know which causal set elements are to the past and future of which other causal set elements. So you can define a causal horizon in the following way. Take your causal set, define a, an infinite time-like curve. And you can do that. That's a chain of elements which is infinite and which 
um, is uh, uh, you can make it my maximal chain, but it's time-like because each of the all, all of the elements are related to each other. So it's a one-dimensional thing, and it's uh, every element is related to every other element. And then you know which elements are in the causal past of that infinite chain. So take that and then divide the causal set into two pieces, one of which is the causal past of this infinite chain and the second of, and, and its complement. So by the definition of causal horizon, the partition of the causal set into two pieces is the causal horizon. So the causal horizon can be defined in an analogous way to the continuum definition, just using the information of the causal set. So, so that's the idea. You, the, those, those surfaces that I drew are continuum approximate, they're, they're, they are emergent, but the definition of the partition of the causal set into two pieces inside horizon and outside horizon, that's, that can be done fundamentally to the causal set. And, and likewise for space-like surface? Yes, indeed. So a space-like surface is then a partition of the causal set into two pieces. And the, the criterion is that every element of the, uh, of the past piece has to, has to uh, you, can't have, you can't have a situation where you have three elements, <laughs> two of which, in a chain and the top and the bottom of the chain are in the same piece of the partition. So there's, there is a, a condition which, which, will, which will force the partition to define a space-like hypersurface rather than something which is time-like. Okay. Thank, yes. you, thank you very much. In the interest of time, I can see there is another question, but let us uh, defer that question to the shared question time uh, later. Thank you very much again, Faye. Thank you. Somehow the key point, the new result, which was, I guess, the second to last slide or so, uh, it was maybe a bit fast for me. Uh, so I would like if you could uh, maybe repeat that or go through that again more slowly, in particular, uh, what is maximal and maximal, but one refers to, and also how this uh, localization of the, uh, events close to the uh, the spatial hypersurface is playing a role in the yes uh, can I Yoma, can I share my screen again go ahead find Okay, so this is the screen. So, yes. The, right. So, the proposal for the molecules are that they are links. That means that they are pairs of elements which are related in the order. In other words, they're elements which um, have a, one is in the future light cone of the other. Um, and there's and they're linked in the sense that there's nothing, they're irreducible relations. There's no other element. So you can see P and Q are supposed to be related there, but there's no other element um, Z that's in between, causally in between them. So in the causal diamond between Q and P, there's, that, that causal diamond is empty. And then the other conditions are that P is maximal in the past of sigma, that means that its causal future to the the part of the its causal future causal future to the past of sigma is empty, and Q is maximal but one. That means that P is the only element that's in the causal part of the causal future of Q to the past of sigma. So those are conditions on this link, and what we did was we took many runs of a 
Poisson process of sampling this space time, which is in, it's a Rindler horizon, so it's just flat. Um, and we just counted the number of these links and then took the expectation value. Um, so that yes. we can do that analytic, but we can also do it analytically. So you can, you can calculate this expected value analytically and you find this result that um, here that the, the average number, the average of this, the expected value of this random variable is the area of the, of the intersection of H and sigma in discreteness units up to a constant. So this, when you say that you can do this analytically, you mean assuming yes. Poisson sprinkling? Or? Yes, assuming Poisson sprinkling. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so now now it's clear. So what you meant right. exactly by the link and maxima connected to the hypersurface. So now, now it was clear before it was a bit quick for me. Okay, thanks okay. a lot. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question.